No, we, uh, we just want to do like a, a Q&A time, and so this is just kind of a relaxed, uh, relaxed setting, um, but uh, we, we always enjoy just getting to know our missionaries a little bit more and finding out about their, their fields and their ministries and things, and so uh, we've got a few questions that, that we'd like to kind of propose, and, and you can kind of just take turns uh, answering these questions and things, and uh, it just helps our folks to be able to get to know you guys a little bit better. Uh, but also to be able to help our folks, um, if they're those that are praying about missions or something like that, how they could uh, maybe be led of the Lord. So, uh, very first of all, could you just kind of tell us how God called you to missions? Uh, what was it that God used in your life to direct you in the area of missions? So, Brother Granger, if you want to start, we'll just kind of go down the line. Sure. Well, I grew up in just south of Indianapolis, <clears throat> so there was a very heavy Hispanic population there, a lot of people from Mexico. Uh, but not only that, as a teenager, I took several trips to Mexico. Uh, and so Mexico has always been a part of my life. And we've got friends who are missionaries in Mexico. And so Mexico was always something the Lord kind of had placed in my life. And so through all of that, he kind of used that to direct me uh, to Mexico. And my wife <clears throat> surrendered at a, as a, you know, at a young age to go wherever the Lord wanted her to go as a missionary. And uh, as we were... Right at the beginning of us dating, I, I looked at my wife and I told her, I said, hey, look, I'm going to be a missionary to Mexico. This is what the Lord has for my life. Uh, if you're not for that, then let's just end the relationship now. And so she said, no, I'm for it. And so the Lord uh, used, our, used that, obviously, to, uh, to knit our hearts together for Mexico. And so that's just kind of what the Lord used to direct us there. Amen. So was, you went on several mission trips, though, you said, to Mexico? Yes, as a teenager. Amen. Very good. All right. Very good. Brother Barton? Um, I, I was privileged to grow up in a Christian home. I, I was able to share a little bit of my testimony this morning um, with, with the teen class, but uh, uh, growing up in a Christian home, I uh, heard the gospel many times, but I, I told them this morning that, you know, if you were to tell me that there were, uh, as Pastor was saying earlier, millions of people around the world that have never heard about Jesus. I mean, I, I never would have believed you. I mean, passing where I'm from, I'm from Knoxville, Tennessee. And so I feel like that's like the buckle of the Bible belt, mm -hmm. uh, passing about 20 churches to get to mine every single Sunday. And, um, you know, that was just the furthest thing from my mind was to think that there are quite literally millions, if not billions of people around the world that uh, don't have a good church, that uh, have never heard about Jesus. And so uh, in February of 2020, literally right before the world shut down for COVID, I went on my very first missions trip. And uh, I got to go to the country of India, uh, spent uh, about 10 days or so uh, there in India. And uh, that was really my first time being exposed to uh, literally, I mean, uh, uh, India alone has over a billion people that live there. And as we were in the city of New Delhi, it's a city of about 25 million people, just one city. And as we were there, I mean, it just it rocked my world in so many ways to see so many people uh, serving all these different false gods and uh, religions and working their fingers down to the bone trying to uh, please a God that they do not know. And uh, I can remember being there and I said, God, if you could ever use me to be a missionary, Lord, here am I, send me. And I uh, began praying about it. And uh, at the beginning of uh, 2023, my wife and I were able to take a internship. Uh, we spent some time in South Africa uh, I believe some of the church knows Mark Coffey and, and some of the people that are there in South Africa. And so we were there in South Africa for three months. And uh, while we were there, we were praying about where God would have us to go as missionaries. And uh, we visited the country of Mozambique two different times. And uh, uh, keep a long story short, we'll share more about it through the week. But uh, after visiting there, uh, my wife and I were there. We, we knew God was calling us to go back full time. And so that's how we surrendered to go to Mozambique specifically. Yeah. Amen. So, Brother Bradley, you're not to a specific country, right? So your ministry is very, it's a very unique ministry. It's, a, it's an amazing ministry, but like for Brother Granger, Mexico, Brother Barton, Mozambique, there's not really necessarily a specific country. So how did, how did the Lord lead you into missions and then to into that specific field that you're working with now? Sure. So I think for me, it's the same similar story as these uh, two other gentlemen that raised in a Christian home. I went on my very first mission trip when I was in ninth grade and God just really used that in my heart in an amazing way to open my eyes to things I didn't know about other other cultures, other communities. 
Uh, fast forward into college years, I was always kind of just surrendered, Lord, wherever you want me to go, I'll do it. And uh, I was willing to go. Uh, when we got married, my wife and I was asked, we were asked by our local hospital uh, to go with a medical team that was going to the jungle region called Satipo, Peru. And it was our first missions trip with uh, any type of medical work being done. And so we got there and our eyes were just immediately open to good gracious. I, we didn't have a clue people lived this way or that they would be so desperate for medical care. And I kept telling my wife all week, I said, you know, if I was a missionary, if I was a church planner in this community, I would be here every day handing out bottles of water, tracks, inviting people to church because it'd be like shooting fish in a barrel. There's about mm. 800 people in line every single day. And they sit out there for eight or 10 hours waiting to get into this clinic nonstop. And um, by the time the week was over, our hearts were just really broken. We just said, you know, I, I said, how about this? What if we, what if we just stay here? Uh, I, I'll play in a church and, and you, you start a clinic here and we'll start a, a ministry here in this community. Well, maybe, you know, what do you think about that? And that was crazy. It was, it was <laughs> not, you know, uh, we had no debt. We had no children and we were like, maybe this could be it. And it was, no, let's, let's go home and just start praying. What is God going to do? Uh, the second year, the owner of the hospital called us again and said, hey, I want to pay for y'all to go to Ecuador, to Zamora, another very jungle region on the Amazon Basin. I want y'all to go there and help another medical team. And this time we went into it knowing a little bit more of what to expect. And we began praying, you know, God, would you please uh, open our hearts and show us what are you trying to, what are you trying to do? Because we know you're moving in our lives. And so we got there and we started asking questions. How'd you get into the country? Where'd you get permissions to do this? And how did this work? And just logistics types of stuff. And at the end of that week, again, I looked at my wife. I said, you want to just stay here? We'll get off the plane. Mm -hmm. We can stay here and let's, let's go home and let's just start praying about it. And the third year, the owner of the hospital came to us, wanted to send us with another team, and we said, hey, thank you so much, but we can't. Uh, God has already used the last two trips in our life in a powerful way. Uh, we've got 28 friends that are in the medical community that are gonna go with us to help a friend of mine who started a church in the Dominican Republic, and we wanna use this, this medical opportunity to help his church there, the same guy I went to when I was in ninth grade. And so we went on our very first trip there to support the Hodges family. And uh, the owner of the hospital said, hey, I want to pay for everything. Send me the receipts wow. to your airline tickets. I'll pay for it. The uh, hospital pharmacy, anything you need, uh, you can take it. Supplies you need, take it. And um, anyway, just this massive encouragement to us. And that first trip, once we finished that first week, uh, we had been home for maybe a week, and God had just really just broken us. We knew we were supposed to do something, and the missionary called us, and he said, Bradley, our church will never be the same again. Mm. Like, this has done more for us than we ever thought. And I said, I'm glad to hear that because we really feel God is calling us to this full time, and he gave me just this huge go for it, do it. And so we did. We resigned our, our positions and uh, ended up going into full-time with MMO. That's been about 20 years ago. Yeah, amen. And you said you've been in over... Since that time, in 20 years, you've been in over 50 countries with different medical groups and things. Yes, sir. Wow, that's, that's amazing. I praise the Lord for that. That's great. Um, a couple of, we got some other questions here and things. Um, and then if we have time, I may open it up to uh, if anybody has a question in here. Um, I've already got a few here. But um, one question is, uh, what's your favorite book of the Bible? Oh, man, probably Acts. Acts? Um, I guess being as a missionary, and that's kind of like the launch of the church. Sure. I love the book of Acts. Yeah, amen. All right, Brother Barton? Um, yeah, that's, that's tough. It's like uh, a lot of times whatever you're reading, right? But um, <laughs> it's true. Um, I would say um, I would probably go with the book of Philippians uh, because uh, Philippians 1 6, I've always used as my life, my life verse that. You know, he which hath begun a good work, and you shall perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. And uh, God's used a lot of different verses there to encourage me along the way. So I would say, uh, yeah, probably Philippians. I, mine would have to be a toss-up between John and Mark. I love reading those two. Those are my favorites. Amen. Very good. Um, who would you say maybe even d during the process of praying about missions and even now, even after, who has influenced your life the most um, in missions, would you say? Living, non-living? E either, sure. Okay. Yeah, either. Mm -hmm. um, well, I mean, this time going back, obviously, Brother Brian here, um, his preaching there at our last missions conference, uh, Stephanie and I were even listening, <clears throat> just last week, we were re-listening to some of those messages. And um, so, I mean, 
for the Stensis obviously was, was a big impact in that for us. Um, <clears throat> but then the Elliots have been a huge, uh, I guess, missionary heroes of mm -hmm. ours that has always, I mean, my, my son's middle name is Elliot. Um, okay. So the Elliots have been a huge impact in our lives as far as missions goes. Mm -hmm. And maybe just briefly, for some that may not know, could you explain who the Elliots are? So Jim and Elizabeth Elliot were missionaries down in Ecuador, and uh, Jim ended, ended up being a martyr. He was only, I believe, 27 years old uh, when he was killed. Uh, him and four other men were trying to reach a tribe uh, there in Ecuador who had never heard the gospel before, who were very hostile. Um, the Shell Oil Company had tried going in there to, to drill for oil and stuff before excavating that type of stuff, and those Indians had killed them. And so, but they had felt the Lord calling them to reach these people with the gospel, um, and they ended up killing them. And so all five of them died. Uh, but Elizabeth, and I believe it was another, another lady or two, um, a while after they had died, went back to that tribe. Mm -hmm. uh, and continued to share the gospel with them. And many people in that tribe ended up getting saved. A church was started. And uh, here's the crazy thing. You can actually go on YouTube and you can see a video of Elizabeth Elliot cutting the hair of the man that actually killed her husband. Mm -hmm. uh, and he became a deacon in their church. Yeah. Like that is just the power of the gospel. Yeah, amen. And it's so powerful that um, even if we, as humans, how spiteful we can be to one another uh, but yet for God so love the world mm -hmm. and uh, if he can forgive me I can forgive others amen yeah amen brother Barton yeah I would say um, at a pivotal time in my life when I was a teenager God gave me a group of really godly friends one of which is uh, brother Jacob Clower who was here last week I was talking to some people uh, beforehand uh, and of course, Jacob and I are, you know, now God has directed us to be in the same country. But uh, uh, before then, uh, I was just a high school kid, and Jacob was a microbiologist in Knoxville. And he would take his lunch breaks, and he'd meet up with me and have Bible studies with me. And uh, he was on that mission trip with me in India, for example. Um, uh, two others uh, that God really used in my life are my brother in laws now. Um, uh, Nate Wilkerson is uh, my wife Morgan's oldest brother. And uh, he's serving the Lord in Benin in West Africa right now. And uh, another one, uh, her other brother, Noah Wilkerson, is uh, also, uh, you know, probably my greatest friend in the world. And uh, we went to the same school there. I grew up in public school there, so we went to the same school. And uh, they were just a godly influence on my life at a pivotal time uh, where I was making decisions about the future. And, uh, you know, like I said, growing up in church and had all these different plans for my life, and I shared a little bit with the teens this morning, kind of how God uh, redirected me towards missions, but uh, uh, I, I think those, those people in my life that God gave me uh, really encouraged me, really helped me to be able to pray about, uh, like I told the teens this morning, you know, not necessarily what my plans are, but if you ever ask God what he wants you to do with your life, and when I was just 16 years old, I said, God, whatever you'd have me to do, Lord, uh, I'll do it. And so uh, he, he certainly used uh, those people in my life as, as well as my pastor and uh, as well as uh, several other people. I, I could go down the line and list, but specifically, I think those group of friends uh, that God gave me and, and were godly influences in my life and really prayed for me and lifted me up and uh, really helped me in, in, in difficult times and things like that uh, really helped me to be able to find uh, the Lord's will for my life and uh, to be able to now be heading to Mozambique as a missionary. So, yeah. Um, mine would be similar as be a conglomerate of people that God just brought in through different situations and in, uh, in the beginning of this ministry. When we started this 20 years ago, there really wasn't a lot of ministries doing anything like this, trying to do medical work in conjunction with local churches abroad. And to be honest with you, we faced really, really stiff um, arms from, from mm -hmm. just being straight, just churches and pastors. It was just more of a, hey, we've heard of social gospel work. We're not interested. And we were trying to explain this is not social gospel. We want the gospel to get to all people. We want to help churches be planted and grow. And it was very difficult. And God used a couple of Christian laymen um, that came into our life that um, began praying with me, meeting with me, encouraging me, and uh, just really kept saying, Bradley, if you know that God has directed you to do this, don't let anybody slow you down. Let, don't let anybody stop you. He will provide. He will open doors. And uh, uh, the pastor actually at my parents' church where I had grown up, 
Uh, his name is Dr. Jeff Amsbaugh. He became one of my, my greatest champions of just, he just, it was kind of like saying sick him to a bulldog. He just kept saying, Bradley, go, go, you can do this. God will, do, God will work it out. God will open doors. And, uh, and then the last would be my wife, uh, just mm -hmm. being in complete honesty. She knew the hardships that we faced at the beginning of this, but she also knew how rock solid we were in our peace of, uh, and assurance of we were called into this. And to have um, a, a ministry partner like that, uh, that we could be so close and walk through this all together has been absolutely amazing. And I couldn't imagine doing it without any of those people that God brought into our life. Yeah, amen. Praise the Lord, that's wonderful. Um, what would you say is the most surprising cultural practice that maybe you've encountered? Um, I know, Brother Bradley, you've been in a lot of different countries for shorter periods of time. Uh, Brother Granger, you've been in Mexico before. Brother Barton, I don't know if maybe in Mozambique or something you would know of anything, but what would be the, maybe a surprising cultural aspect that you've encountered um, along the road? Anybody want to take a stab? Uh, yeah, I, 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 so uh, of course we haven't been full-time on the field, and so... I'm sure that uh, uh, I will be able to answer this question better in a couple of years, but uh, just from the experience that I've had there so far and things like that, I think there's two things that come to mind. Uh, one of which is, uh, you know, there in Mozambique, there's not this understanding, like it, the resistance to the gospel is not a lack of belief in God. It is, it is a plethora of other religions that are filling the void mm -hmm. there. And I think as we were there and we saw uh, this country, I mean, everybody believes something. You go talk to somebody, they believe that there's a God. And, and, and they're trying to worship him. And they're, they're, they're uh, through either Islam or through uh, some of them Catholicism, uh, through some of them animism, worshiping ancestors. They're, they, they believe that there is a supernatural higher power, uh, but they just didn't know who he was. And... Uh, for many people, even like in animistic beliefs, you know, there's all this very spiritualized things and uh, a lot of spiritual warfare, a lot of demonic things that, that take place with animism and their practices. I mean, it's got traces off into like voodoo and things like that. And people are almost like their connection and their relationship with God and spiritual things is more on a fear-based level. Like, I've got to make sure that I, I walk the line because I don't want curses and I don't want mm. these different things that come upon my family. And, you know, as a Christian, when I think about my relationship with the Lord, it's like uh, you think about the sacrificial love of Jesus and you think about how uh, Brother Granger was just saying, how God so loved the world. And, you know, he was willing to do all that just to have a relationship with, with you and I uh, as a free gift of salvation, you know, and, and having that completely different understanding of where we even come from in our relationship to God. And then the other thing was, even through Jacob, uh, Brother Jacob Clower and our communication, of course, we, as he's a really close friend of mine, he was talking to me and he was saying that, uh, oh yeah, he's like, I, I talk to people all the time and, and they tell me, even if they don't faithfully attend a church, that they've been to a church and uh, things like that. And I'm like, really? I was like, well, what is their like, understanding of it? And he said, <laughs> He said, uh, most people, when they think about church, they think about dancing. And I was like, dancing? And he was like, yeah, I, I was telling even uh, the, the guard for our community that we live in, he's like, I was talking to him and I was inviting him to church. And he was like, oh, yeah, I love church. He's like, we go there and we dance. We have a great time. And, and uh, Jake was like, really? And, and he looked at him and he was so confused. He was like, you don't have dancing at your church? He's like, is that not what you do? And he was like... No, we usually sing some songs and somebody preaches from the Bible. And he looked at him like he had three heads. He was like, <laughs> so, so the, the disconnect there of mm. even when people think about church, the furthest thing from their mind is, uh, you know, uh, somebody preaching from the Bible or, uh, uh, you know, biblical truth. You know, it, it's the furthest thing from their mind. It's more of a social event uh, than anything else. And so I think that's another surprising thing we saw there, too. I think one of the things that's was, I mean, it's one of those things where like, I knew, but I didn't realize to the extent of it. And it's both frustrating and a blessing both at the same time. And that is how slow and chill people are in Mexico. Mm. The only thing Mexicans get in a hurry for is driving. <clears throat> uh, <laughs> and so it's, it's, it's frustrating because sometimes it's like, hey, 
for example, I need a, I need a car part, so I'll go down to the auto parts store. They're like, oh, yeah, we've got it across town here. Come back in an hour, and we'll, we'll have it for you. You know, you go back in an hour. You know, it's 3 o'clock. I, I, I'll be back at 4. I get there at 4. Oh, yeah, well, let me call them, and they'll bring it right down. You know, so it, it's frustrating. And, but, uh, but on the other hand, it's also a blessing because if you, a, a lot of times when you hand somebody a track, uh, even if you're just passing out tracks, they'll, they'll literally stop where they are and just sit back and read it because time is, is much more uh, slow in Mexico. Um, so on that hand, it, it's much, of a, much more of a blessing. And if you want to have a conversation with somebody about the gospel, they'll literally just stop yeah. and just talk with you. Uh, and so it's a blessing that way, but also frustrating at, at times. So yeah. I never really understood the extent of that until we actually moved there mm-hmm. uh, and, and lived there like we did. Yep. Yeah. That's something that people in America just speed. Well, I, you know, wish, I wish... Fast. I wish yeah. America would adapt more of that, to be right, honest yeah. with you, because mm-hmm. it would be much more healthy for us to just kind of slow down sometimes. Yeah. Yep. Brother Badley, anything? I would say a lot of our cultural differences we just notice in the medical world, in all honesty, and just the way people oh, are yeah. treated, uh, the way access to care is, the lack of education for health care. So you have a lot of people in most underdeveloped countries. It's a pay-as-you-go system. Uh, most of it is socialized health care. And when you're dealing with an underdeveloped or a broken governmental system, there's no money for the care. And so mm-hmm. while you may have a structure, a hospital structure, and you may have medical professionals who work there, um, it's very common in a lot of the countries we work in where, oh, we have an x-ray machine, but it hasn't worked in two years. But we sit in an office next to an x-ray machine all day, every day that doesn't even work. Yeah. And it's this false sense of hope that are being given to the patients, to the people. And, you know, the Bible tells us hope deferred makes the heart sick. And after hope being deferred over and over, you begin to lose trust. You begin to uh, lose even that sense of humanity of caring for other people. And so for us to come into communities and say, no, we're going to do exactly what we told you we are going to do. We have the medicine in our pharmacy. We have our own lab. We have our own wound care. If we need it, we bring our own x-rays. We bring everything that we need to do. We'll do this for you here today, and it's going to be 100% free of charge to watch people just kind of sit there in bewilderment. Like, are you serious? You're going to do all of these things? And then naturally the question becomes, why? Why, why would you do this? I, I had an imam in West Africa that came to our clinic one day because after call to prayer, most of the people left uh, the, the, the facility across the street came into our clinic and he came over wanting to know, why are you doing this? What are you trying to do? Why are you brainwashing people? And it was simply just the answer of no, we've been loved so much by Christ that we want to love other people because we see them as human beings created in God's image. And to be able to have that type of testimony or work opportunity and serving in grace in that way is, is really neat to overcome some cultural barriers mm-hmm. even. Amen. Now, specifically for you, um, I know you talked about how, you know, doctors and nurses and people, they, they volunteer to go on your trips and things, and so that's how you, you, you know, you take medical people, but medicine, equipment, how do you, how do you get, where does the medicine come from that you take and the equipment and how, how, do you, how does that all work? Maybe so explain a little bit about a, that. It's a huge hodgepodge. I'll, I'll try to condense it really quick. Uh, basically, anything that's over the counter, if you can walk into CVS and buy it off the counter and take it with you out of the door, uh, those are things that we really rely heavily on from just church groups, uh, school groups, community groups, a lot of different people that help donate those things to us. We have like an Amazon wish list that stays on our website because we use hmm. anything that can come off those shelves. Anything that would be prescriptive authority, we We have a license by the FDA. We have our own pharmacy on site. We have a compliance team that works with us. So we procure those things. So a lot of that happens through just uh, generous Christian business owners and individuals that will say, hey, I'd like to help buy a pharmacy for a country, those kind of things. And they help with that. Um, And so God has just brought a lot of people together to help us. When it comes to equipment, again, we do fundraisers sometimes. We do a lot of different things because our ministry is a little bit more unique um, where, you know, for us, we have a a surgical facility in Central America. And, you know, it's cost us probably $5 million to put together. But we can do orthopedic surgery, general surgery. We can do uh, cataracts. We can do all kind of stuff there. And so it definitely has a little bit higher price tag, but we're also ministering to thousands of people Mm -hmm. in all of Central America because they can travel freely without a passport Mm -hmm. or a visa. All they need is their national ID. So missionaries are bringing people from their community so that we can care for them so that they can in turn go back and people hear of lives transformed and that this church really does care for us as people. 
And so we believe the investment is absolutely worth it. And so it's kind of a, a, a massive project that God just over the years, um, there's been people who, who have come and it's just a dentist who said, you know what, I know for a fact that we could use this portable delivery unit because we've used them in nursing homes. And you know what, I want to buy one and give it to the ministry. Mm. And so people have just been very good to us and blessed us in that way to allow the ministry to expand. So all the medicine you have to take with you as well, or do we you get do, that in country? Unless the government does not allow. So we have compliance teams that will work for a year to two in advance with all the government officials. We get licensed in the country. We carry malpractice insurance. We have all of our importation paperwork put together, everything so that when we show up, uh, we have a, an agreement with Delta Airlines where we get to check it as part of our luggage. Wow. And we show up and we'll have several thousand pounds of medicine and supplies and equipment, thousands of pairs of glasses, you know, all of these kind of things. We present all of our documentation. Unless the government says, absolutely not, we don't allow it to be imported, you have to buy it in country, mm -hmm. and then that's a whole other process. Right. So you're just not putting together a team, you know, in three months and saying, hey, let's go. This is, this is a year, year process. Sure, we're like already we're working at. on 27 and 28 right now. Wow. All countries will work in. Wow, amen. That's amazing. Um, I think, Brother Barton, you kind of mentioned something that kind of struck a question. Let's talk about safety. Right? Obviously, Mexico, obviously the biggest thing you hear about Mexico is gangs and drug lords and all this kind of stuff. Um, what's the safety like? Obviously, both of you guys, you have families that you're taking to live in Mexico, to live in Mozambique, um, small children, right? What is, what is safety like? What would you, how could you uh, maybe explain that a little bit there in Mexico and then in Mozambique? Well, um, in Zacatecas, when we had our, when we were starting our church there, actually my wife and Gabriela was, I don't know, five, maybe six months old at the time. She actually almost got kidnapped <clears throat> when we were in Zacatecas. Wow. Um, so that area was much more dangerous than what Guadalajara is. The Guadalajara area um, is, is safer. It's the second largest um, city in Mexico. Um, and uh, this is, this is kind of how I distinguish it from, from the rest of the country is, the largest cartel in Mexico right now is Cartel Jalisco, and they're in 20-some of the 30-some states in Mexico. Um, Jalisco is the state in which Guadalajara is in. So Guadalajara is um, the, the home grounds, home turf, if you will, of the largest cartel in Mexico. So there's no turf wars that goes on there. So we've never, I mean, I, I know of some people that are in the cartel, uh, but we've never had any issues with the cartel or anything like mm -hmm. that uh, in Guadalajara. Um, however, with Guadalajara, that metropolitan area being 14 million people, there is big city crime, just like any big city you mm -hmm. go to. Um, but to be honest with you, I've never really felt um, like the level of kidnap threatened kind of thing, life threatened in Guadalajara. Um, <clears throat> there are much more um, Americans, foreigners in Guadalajara because of how big and metropolitan it is. So it's not uncommon to see American or, you know, foreign people in Guadalajara. So it's a little safer that way uh, in light of that. But, I mean, we do have little children, and they're loud, and we are foreigners. So whether um, my kids want to say, hey, Daddy, look at this in English in a Spanish-speaking mm -hmm. country, everybody immediately goes, whoop. Um, so we do stand out. Mm -hmm. And so it, we're just... We just try to be over cautious when we're at the grocery store to make sure the kids are close. We have an eye on them because it doesn't take but a second for somebody to snatch them right. and run off with them. And I mean, that could be we never see them again or like uh, give us so much money and you get your kid back type mm -hmm. of thing. Um, so it's always we try to try to keep an eye on the kids. Uh, we also try to surround ourselves with um, people that we've built trust with. And so we've left our kids with people in our church before that we've built trust with, mm -hmm. especially when, when my wife was giving uh, birth to our second um, child, Gabriella had to go and stay with some folks at our church, but we've built rapport with them. We know them, we mm -hmm. trust them. And um, they, they, we communicated with them, hey, they're, they're a target. So be cautious, don't take them out around town and stuff, mm -hmm. stay at home with them, that type of stuff. And so we're just, we just try to be extra cautious, extra careful. Um, going around this time, we're gonna, we'll probably end up buying air tags, um, mm -hmm. just as an extra layer of precaution and mm -hmm. finding some way to attach that right. to them, whether that be in their shoe or some way in their clothes or something, just so we can, we can if, even if they do get snatched up or something, we can track them, mm -hmm. you know? And so there's that extra layer of 
precaution there. I mean, when, when our daughter had her seizures, um, I mean, I was thankful that I was trained in CPR, and so I just want to be sure that I'm trained to be able to properly handle right. whatever those type of situations may come up yeah. as well. Very good. Brother Barton, what about Mozambique? Um, yeah, so I think similarly, you, you have to be careful. You have to be cautious. Um, Mozambique is like the sixth poorest country in the world, so, um, you know, when they look at you, they automatically think you're this multimillionaire, you know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, and probably comparatively you are to them, right? Um, because uh, for many of them, I mean, they just only have the things for basic needs, and so you have to be careful. Uh, I think petty crime is more common uh, than than serious violent crime. Uh, my my language school teacher was telling me that the people of Mozambique are very friendly, very passive. We experienced some of that while we were there. Um, Jacob's experienced it there too, and it's told me about uh, living there. We've known missionaries and their families that have lived there for uh, 15, 20 years and uh, uh, never had any issues as far as, you know, any serious crime and things like that. Uh, the people are very welcoming. They're very warm, uh, very loving uh, overall in general. Uh, you just have to be careful about those certain things. I mean, there's certain parts of town that you know not to go to at night. Uh, but even in Knox, where I grew up, that was the same way, you know, it's like uh, you stay away from this part of town uh, at night and things like that. So you do have to be careful. You have to be cautious. Uh, you have to make sure you, you kind of are aware of your surroundings and things like that. Uh, but probably the, the, the biggest thing that has been faced by all the missionaries that we've known of there is just uh, petty crime and things like that, uh, just because you're in an impoverished country. So uh, if you leave your backpack sitting there, I would not expect it to be back. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you turn your back on it for, you know, any length of time, you know, don't expect it to just be still sitting there. So uh, you just have to watch out for things like that. But overall, uh, the country of Mozambique is, is safe. You just have to be careful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brother Bradley, what about going in? Is there any type of safety concerns or anything when you take a group? You know, you're taking 20, 30 people maybe into a, a country. Any safety concerns? Sure. So we always work with the U.S. State Department, and we identify and provide for them an itinerary for the entire week of where we're going to be, where we're staying, what we're there doing. Uh, we provide numbers between ourselves and the liaison at the State Department there um, abroad. Um, we also have a security officer on our staff that kind of helps us with security plans and make sure that, make sure that we have... Uh, you know, some type of uh, emergency response plan and everything that we can carry out should we need to. Um, a lot of times you just are trying to be careful to not make yourself a target. That's, that's the biggest part of it all. Uh, most Americans that get hurt abroad or you hear the horror stories are usually somewhere where they shouldn't be, like we just heard, at a time they shouldn't be there. And so for us, it's, it's, you know, we're not taking set patterns of travel most of the time. Uh, we don't leave the hotels at night that we're staying in. We're just very cautious and, again, uh, doing everything we can to remove a target from ourselves. Right. And then the reality is, too, we are so welcomed into most of the communities because of what we're doing that we've actually had kind of the opposite reaction where we've had people say, hey, we want to come down and, and just make sure that you're okay every day. We want to make sure to come down in our cars and we'll escort you to make sure everything is fine. Uh, we know how much we need you in our community. We won't let anybody hurt you. Yeah. And so that's been a tremendous blessing as well. God's been good. I'm, I'm more scared of Atlanta traffic than I am uh, <laughs> most of the places we go. I would agree with you on that. I would rather go anywhere in Africa than Atlanta, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Um, what about like, um, how do you guys get like, obviously support, you know, especially like you guys going to Mexico, Mozambique, um, maybe explain to the church how, how you get support, what's the banking system like there, the value of the dollar, things like that. What, how, how does that kind of work? So in Mexico right now, the value is, I just checked it today, it's 20.3 or yeah, 20.3. Uh, to one, so about 20 pesos to one dollar, and um, we can use our American bank cards and stuff in Mexico. Uh, there's obviously a surcharge, you know, foreign surcharge and stuff usually, um, but we can get a Mexican bank account, and we can transfer money from our bank account to our Mexican bank account, um, however, however often we need to do it, and because it's both in our names, that percentage goes down, um, but we get, um, you know, our, our Everything, all of our funds goes through our mission board. Our mission board gives, you know, sends us the the funds that we we get every month, and then we can take that and we can deposit that into our Mexican bank account. Mm -hmm. um, because we already pay taxes on it here, um, there is an international charge, but there's no added taxes on it there, mm -hmm. and so that's a blessing. Okay, 
How about Mozambique? How'd... Yeah, uh, similar in the sense of, uh, you know, when we get there, we'll have a uh, uh, bank account set up that's for there. Um, but uh, we'll also have stateside bank accounts and different things like that. Uh, similarly, our mission board that will uh, be able to handle uh, those funds like that and to be able to provide us what we need every month and things like that. So uh, with that, uh, once, once we're there in the country, we'll be able to set up um, a bank account there just so that way, uh, you know, we can have easily transferable funds there in the country. But uh, our American bank cards will still work uh, for a small fee. Uh, whenever I was in South Africa, you, uh, I, I could even use, I don't even have like a big bank. It was just a, a bank in Tennessee. But um, I was able to use my card and, and, and get money out or whatever. And many times they would even cover the, uh, the international, the uh, transaction the, fee. Yeah, transaction fee. Mm -hmm. Uh, so um, uh, we'll be able to do that, uh, you know, credit cards and different things like that. They uh, typically, the, you know, even the ones we have and things like that, they have no foreign transaction fees. And so I'll be able to use all that kind of stuff too as well. Uh, but as soon as we get in the country, we'll set up a uh, bank account there as well. But then we'll also have our stuff here that's uh, also helping uh, get us the support we need. So, yeah. Mozambique has obviously had a lot of turmoil in the past. How, what's the country like now? Is, is it safe to be there? Is it pretty stable? What's yeah, kind of what's going um, on with Mozambique? Yeah, so Mozambique went through uh, about 20 years of civil war from 1975 to the 1990s. Uh, from that point on, uh, the country's really been recovering, and that's why you see a lot of different things of the statistics that I'll share with you later But about the country. But um, in, um, let's see, just uh, recently, uh, back in October, uh, the country had an election. They're technically a democratic country. The thing about that, though, is the same political party has won the election ever since it has been established. <laughs> mm -hmm. So uh, you can imagine the frustration because when nobody's voting for somebody and they always win, uh, you begin to think, is this really a democracy? <laughs> uh, so my language school teachers even tell me about that. So even recently, there's been some political uh, turmoil there. People that they, they want things to change, but the last thing that people want there is to go to war again. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they were just in a war and the, it only ended the mid-1990s. So uh, he was telling me nobody there wants to go to war. Uh, and for many of them, they would rather live a peaceable life in a corrupt governmental system uh, than to go to war right now. And so uh, for that reason, you know, right now there's been some protests and different things like that. Um, there's been a few people that were killed. I think they might have tried to do some things they weren't supposed to do, though. Uh, you know, attacking police or military or something like that. But uh, overall, I mean, the country's stable. The problem with African uh, countries in many contexts is that the government uh, can many, many times be very corrupt and, uh, you know, only servicing themselves. And, you know, I know government corrupt, big shocker, but... Uh, uh, in, in many cases there, it's very blatant, it's very obvious, and the people just have to deal with it sometimes. And so it, it's similar to that in Mozambique. And so uh, they're sort of dealing with that even now as we speak. Um, I don't believe there's another war that's going to break out. I mean, Jacob's there right now. He says his area is pretty quiet. Uh, there's been some riots and uprisings and things like that about people protesting uh, peacefully. The other political party candidate that everybody wants elected has uh, called for everybody to just peacefully protest and things like that. So, uh, you know, we'll see if it makes a difference or not. Uh, my language school teacher told me that he doesn't think it's going to make a difference, but he's also very pessimistic because his whole life he's only seen the same thing happen mm -hmm. over and over again. So uh, we'll, we'll see what happens. But, yeah, right now it's, it's safe to be there overall. Yeah, very yeah. good. Let me ask one more question for each of you guys. Um, someone that's maybe thinking about missions or feeling that God has called them to missions, um, what advice would you give to them? If they feel like God's called them to be a missionary or they're, they're kind of maybe leaning towards missions or something, maybe give them a piece of advice or something that maybe helped you um, in, in maybe kind of knowing what God's will might be for their life. Do it. Do it. There you go. I like that. <laughs> Amen. Do it. Well, I mean, I... I, I... Seriously, though, I mean, because a lot of people are like, well, I'm going to be a firefighter or I'm going to do this or I'm going to do that. Lord, if you want me to do missions work, then I'll do that. I think that should be flipped. Amen. 
I really think that that is backwards worldly thinking. It should be, Lord, I feel like you're calling me to do this. I'm going to go ahead and do it. Lord, if you want me to be a firefighter, if you want me to be a lawyer, if you want me to do something else, then call me to that. And that's okay. I mean, as long as you're following God's will for your life and you're actively pursuing God, um, he's going to direct you. You, you know, you take the, the life of Samuel. Uh, I, we taught in Super Church this morning. He's like, well, how do I know God's will for my life? Well, he's not going to reveal that to you until you're faithfully serving him. Mm -hmm. Samuel, God didn't speak to Samuel until Samuel was already serving him. And so faithfully serve God, get involved in your church, stay faithful, work, um, share the gospel, read your Bible, pray, just, just pursue God. And if he, you feel like he's calling you into missions, pursue it. Uh, and then if God decides to call you some, somewhere else, he will close the door. Mm -hmm. He will, and he will, and he will uh, direct you other ways. But just, just do it. Amen. Yeah. Um, I had the privilege to talk to the teens about this some this morning, but um, really the advice that I, I would give them, when, when I look back over my life to see how God took me from where I was serving in my church to now being a missionary to Mozambique, I really look back and I see that uh, I took the next step that God had for me and uh, I, I walked through the doors that God opened in my life. It wasn't necessarily this, like, uh, I was telling them, like, riding in the sky kind of thing that people always talk about wanting uh, to know if God wants them to be a missionary or not. And so for any young person or anybody even considering missions, I would say, uh, you know, first and foremost, just start serving where you are. Just as Brother Granger just said, uh, I think many times we have this idea of, like, okay, I'm praying about if God wants me to serve him in the future, but uh, I'm not really serving him right now. There's, some, there's a disconnect there. Uh, in Acts 13, when the Bible uh, says that the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me Paul and Barnabas where into, for the work where unto I've called them, Paul and Barnabas were already serving in their church. I mean, uh, you know, for, for, for somebody that's not doing anything in the church and to say, yeah, I feel like God's called me to be a missionary, that's foreign to the Bible. Uh, you, you see that God is already using and moving people that are already actively serving him where they are. And so uh, get active where you are. Get involved with that. Uh, get in your Bible. Uh, stay faithful in praying. Stay faithful in witnessing here. Uh, doing all those things that will ultimately, uh, God will use that in your life to be able to direct your steps. I want to also say, just to back up what he said there, uh, I believe it's in Philippians 2. It says that it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You know, I struggle with that sometimes whenever I can remember I was wanting to surrender to the mission field, and I was like, is this really God calling me or not? And uh, I really had to wake up a little bit and think, I don't think it's the devil that is right. putting these things in my heart to yeah. go be a missionary. True. <laughs> you yeah. know, I don't think this is the devil working in my life to, to trick me or anything. And so many times we can complicate the will of God for our life uh, and, and God is not the author of confusion. Mm -hmm. He wants to make it very plain and simple for you. And so just take the next step that he has for you. And if you're praying about missions now, get involved in serving where you are and pray that God would open the next door for you in your life. I, I agree 100%. I would say that you're, you're uh, serving, you're trusting him, you're trusting the sovereignty of God in your life and what he's calling you to do. I would, I would share those, those, um, those thoughts or, or the direction that God is leading you with, uh, your pastor, with folks that you trust in your life as a spiritual mentor. Uh, but then also, I wouldn't put any contingencies to it. I think anytime we start adding contingencies to it, mm -hmm. well, let me finish this phase of life or let me complete this before I do that. Um, unless you've been directed by someone in your life that's trying to help give you good advice, sometimes you can put obstacles in front of yourself without really realizing it. And so when we trust God and we acknowledge him, this is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, and what he's trying to do, how he's already provided for you and brought you to this point in life, uh, when we start seeking counsel from other people and allowing godly influences, it helps us to build a, a path that we can follow him, watching him lead us and getting us to that point of where he's trying to take us to serve him. Um, and I think that that's, uh, you know, 
what I would encourage anyone to do. Like you say, be involved, be serving now, be close and listening to what the, the Lord is doing and leading in your life. Share it with a spiritual mentor, with your pastor, and then begin making plans. Again, uh, don't look at it as something you're going to do in the future. Uh, if we believe the Lord is coming back any day now, then we should be hard at work at trying to reach the, go- the world with the gospel while we Amen. can right this moment. Amen. Very good. Um, how many of you have a question you'd like to ask one of the missionaries? If you have a question, if you have a question, raise your hand. How many of you have a question? Only two or three of you. I think there's probably more questions. Well, what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get ready to dismiss. If you raise your hand, you got a question. That means you need to go and talk to one of the missionaries, okay? Um, and uh, so we're going to dismiss here in a minute. But um, the one thing I, I want you to you understand why it's so important to pray for your missionaries. They talk about the safety in many of the countries. Again, some countries it's not as bad, but there are others where there are there are real dangers and threats. And, uh, and so pray for our missionaries. That's why every week we bring up missionaries to be praying for that week uh, and let them know they're being prayed for. And then I don't know if you noticed, I think all three of them said it, it was through a missions trip that God really helped them to see um, the rest of the world and how the world lives and things. And of course, uh, we have a mission trip coming up. We just had one uh, back in August. We went to Uganda. And next year we've got a missions trip coming up. And so if you're interested in it, I'd really encourage you to go. Uh, you say, well, you know, I just, I don't know if God's going to call me to missions or not. That's fine. You don't have to know, but go uh, and just allow your eyes to be open to what uh, God is doing in the rest of the world and what can be done. And if God doesn't call you to go, that's going to give you a better burden to support the missionaries that are going as well, because you know what they're facing, you know what is going on there. And so I appreciate you guys being up here. Thank you. You guys can have a seat.